Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alberto Bonilla. I am the marketing manager of energy and environment at Technalia. First of all, I would like to thank you for your interest in this webinar about testing and research in offshore environments, an opportunity for energy generation, a challenge for materials that we have organized. The lecturers will be Antonio Rico that will talk us about technological solutions for offshore renewable energy and Pablo Benguria that will focus on how to extend the lifetime of materials and components in offshore environments. The webinar will involve a presentation time of about 45 minutes, followed by a question time of approximately 15 minutes. The questions can be made using the chat in the application in any type during the presentations. They will be answered when it when they finish it. We will upload uh, uh, this the, the video the video of the webinar in uh, the YouTube channel of Technolia, and you will receive a link to uh, see it. Uh, the first lecture is Antonio Rico. Antonio is a naval architect. He comes from the offshore and shipbuilding sector. He's working at Ternalia for 10 years in different positions, but always, uh, always related to, to the sea. He's author of several patents in operation at this moment, focused on reducing ocean energy costs through, through uh, improvements in cable installation uh, process, as well as means for electrical conditions in offshore environments. And with you for the ado, I give Antonio Rico the, the floor. Please, Antonio. Thanks, uh, Alberto, for your introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for your time and interest in this matter. Uh, firstly, in this slide, we leave you the contact of my colleague Pablo, as well as mine, uh, in case you want to contact us in the future. Um, I will divide my presentation into three topics. First, an overview of marine energy and how the coronavirus crisis can affect its growth. After that, I'll show you some developments which we are working on Technalia, we are working on here in Technalia. And finally, I'll show you some outlines about the Haslab designs. Uh, if that's okay, if that's okay, um, to see the full screen view, in addition, you have already seen how ugly I am. I'm going to stop my camera, okay, to follow the presentation in full screen. Okay. I would like to start my presentation with these figures from a World Resources Institute study. This report tries to identify the main actions required for climate change mitigation. It concludes that we should look at the seas as part of the solution to helping combat the effects of climate change. Regarding this study, about 10% of decarbonization measures must be taken by using offshore renewable energy. Other interesting actions may be linked with offshore renewable energy because they can share facilities or infrastructures, are the carbon storage in seabed or ocean-based transport. From a point of view, the success of these technologies will stand in knowing how to hybridize between there or at least how to share spaces and facilities or infrastructure. Offshore renewable energy can be divided into two groups regarding where the energy is. The first one, ocean energy. Seawater is where the energy is. For example, uh, waves, tides, thermal or salinity gradient. I mean, the energy to be harvested is from the ocean and not, for example, for, for another source such as wind or, or something like that. And the second group, other renewables available on the offshore environment, 
but whose energy must be harvested from, for example, wind, sand, biomass, and not from seawater. I think it is important to clarify this difference, since, as you can see, some of the devices take advantage of the energy of the ocean, while others only take advantage of a space or the best resources of the wind or sand in offshore conditions. Renewable ocean energy is far from being cost competitive. At the moment, renewable ocean energy is at the same spot that the wind energy was a few years ago, well, a few, uh, some years ago. It is taking over 40 years for wind energy to reach its actual current profitable position. So all I can see is patents. For now, I think that we will only see this type of devices in niche applications, at least in the next year. An interesting niche is that of power generation in insulated systems such as Iceland or oil and gas platform. I'm sure that in the short term, the first commercial ocean energy devices will be seen in this application. However, offshore wind are growing and growing both turbine power and installed capacity. Last year, for example, offshore wind reached almost 4 gigabytes of power installed, leaving behind the break in 2016 or 2018, years where the growing trend of offshore wind energy were broken. Here, a slide about the future perspective that uh, offshore wind, that for example, these future perspectives are even better than the growth that has already been experienced. 450 gigabytes are expected to be installed in Europe into the next 30 years. Uh, I would like to highlight that this is more than 100 times the current power is stored at present. Uh, in Europe, you can find here four main focus. Atlantic Sea, Baltic Sea, North Sea and Mediterranean Sea. And of course, as you know, a similar expectation for USA and Asia market. And in the middle of all this already mature market, and due to the necessity for installing wind power turbines in deeper waters, a new te technology is emerging right now. This is new technology, well, not uh, so new, but this technology is the floating offshore wind. As you know, several experimental floating wind farms has been commissioned in the last few years. High wind Scotland, Kingardine, we float Atlantics. Successful experimental farms that are demonstrating that floating wind technology has come to stay and develop as a robust renewable energy solution. With a cost of energy not yet competitive, a significant cost reduction is expected in the next 10 years for this new energy, for this floating offshore wind. Even prices similar to those of offshore wind energy are expected. Offshore wind, I, I, I mean fixed offshore wind energy. It seems that uh, compared to fixed offshore wind, the floating offshore wind trend is outdated about 10 years. Here, a picture of the three floating platforms for wind float Atlantic farm which left Ferrol a few days ago. I don't know if you can see it during our quarantine. But what happened now? What happened with the coronavirus crisis? When everything seemed to be going well, no? The coronavirus struck us. And now? And now what? Um, let, me, let me tell you a short story. Uh, because during this quarantine, during the hardest lockdown days, I have read an interesting book, How to Rebuild Our War After an Apocalypse. In Spanish, you can find this book in Spanish, is uh, Abrir en Caso de Apocalipsis, if you want to buy. 
This book is, uh, is uh, the philosopher and writer Lewis Darnell. Lewis, in this book, justifies that after an apocalypse, conventional energy resources will not longer be accessible because the superficial deposit of gas, fuel or coal have already been spent many years ago and now highly specialized tools and workers are needed to reach the 16 resources. However, uh, building a wind turbine or using a pre-apocalypse solar panel will be much easier. Thus, Lewis claims that, apocalypse, uh, that a post-apocalypse uh, civilization will be green. From a point of view, the crisis we are living in is not an apocalypse, uh, for the moment at least, but perhaps this is the opportunity that we are looking for for, 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 for renewable energies. Many organizations and companies think so. Thus, we must think of this crisis an opportunity for renewable energies. And what is the challenge? What is the challenge for, for renewable energies? The challenge, uh, renewable energy as cheap as possible. Always, always is the same. Always is the price. I think you know personally this uh, formula, but um, in this formula, I think you know there are four main parameters. You know, initial capital cost, annual operating expenses, finance parameters, energy productions. To reduce the cost on energy, we must add on these four parameters. For example, initial capital cost or manufacturing and installation cost, which can be reduced with actions such as optimization designs, better performing materials or innovation in new installation process. The annual operating expenses or operation and maintenance cost, this can be decreased by considering new methods for maintenance, such as the digital energy that everybody is listening about that, or any other actions that improve the farm reliability. From a point of view, the forgotten parameter is the financial parameters or how to reduce the investor risk. Uh, as you know, when you are when you are thinking in invest in a in a farm, uh, this this investor has a price has a price that is uh, directly according with the risk of this part. So mm, to reduce the investor risk, uh, we should take measure uh, to ensure that the FAR commissions is on time or reducing uncertainties about energy resources. And about the last parameter, energy production, as you know, increasing the farm availability, increasing the power install, ATC. This slide is a college is a collage, excuse me, of pictures about the different steps to carry out a mooring calculation, force, offset, and so on. All of them as a result of various numerical models. At Technalia, for some time, we have been considering one more model in this calculation, the cost model. Thus, the cost must be the key driver when we are designing a far and the key topic for taking decisions. Next slides are some examples in which Tesnalia is working on following this key driver, the cost. For example, this first slide, Nautilus, is a floating offshore wind platform whose main feature is its main dimension smaller than other platforms, allowing it to be built or assembled in more cost-effective facilities, such as a uh, conventional shipyard, similar uh, the shipyard uh, to build ships. Mainly, Technalia has been working on advanced numerical modeling for better optimization of Nautilus, both structurally and in the mooring design or electrical export connection. Another interesting development is Conectados, an innovative umbilical connector 
specifically designed for offshore renewable energy devices because the normal subsea connector used in this area in, uh, in uh, offshore energies are connectors from offshore, uh, from oil and gas, and the cost of this kind of connector should be very expensive. That's a Tecnalia patent licensed to the trail, a bus company which is now starting its commercialization. One of my favorites is the Scarabo, an underwater road uh, remote operated vehicle for subsea cable installation on offshore wind farms, mainly the, the interarray cable or the cable between towers. And uh, well, this is the, the focus of this device. This patented asset is uh, looking for a company to be licensed. So if anybody of you wants to speak about, we were happy to, to, to attend about how to how to progress, how to go forward in this in this uh, in this uh, solution. And finally, finally, uh, the Harz Lab 1.0, an offshore laboratory which my colleague Pablo will tell you about shortly, and which has been entirely designed by Technalia. This lab arises from the necessity of many companies to be able to test materials and components in real offshore environments before launching the products on the market. So there is a gap between the, the test that you can do in a normal lab. And uh, this is the reason that this laboratory is here, because it's, uh, this, this laboratory tries to, 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 to be in this gap for, for, for test in real environment. Now, in Technalia, we are working in the second edition of this Harz Lab, the Harz Lab 2.0, in collaboration with IDOM, which is carrying out the detailed design. For example, here in a scope, you can see some first pictures of the final design. And uh, well, Pablo tells you in a few minutes about, uh, about this new lab and the features of this new lab, so I prefer don't, don't speak to Max about Pablo. So this is my my presentation, and uh, yes, uh, I would like to to highlight that we are in LinkedIn in Technalia as a marine energy profile. So if you want to be informed what we are working on, you can follow us. Uh, thanks again for your attention, and now it's the turn to my colleague Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for this interesting presentation. I remember the audience that uh, questions about this presentation can be made <coughs> using the chat in the application and they will be answered after the, the presentation of Pablo Benguria. Uh, Pablo Benguria will talk, talk us about the, the, Harz, the, Harz Lab, uh, uh, the Harz Lab laboratory that was designed mainly to extend the lifetime of uh, materials and components in real offshore environment. Mr. Pablo Benguria holds a degree in biology and other in environmental science by the University of the Basque Country. He joins Technalia back uh, in uh, 26 and since April 2016, Pablo is project manager in the materials for extreme conditions group where he managed both private and public research projects. Pablo is also the manager of the Harz Lab Offshore Materials and Components Lab, a unique offshore laboratory for the testing of materials and components in real offshore environments that we will, we will uh, describe as in detail. Pablo, whenever you like, please. Okay, uh, I will go into my full screen mode. Okay, I think everything is nice now. Okay, so thank you for this uh, nice presentation and for uh, Antonio's introduction to the offshore activities in Technalia. Um, I will I will go through these seven points. Uh, so some of them uh, I will talk about them quite quickly. So don't be scared about the length of the of the slides. I I think I 
prepare the, the material for 25 minutes, so I think that there will be any problem. So first, I will, I will start talking a little bit of uh, relevance of testing in real offshore environments. Uh, then I'll go through the, some ex examples of offshore, offshore testing around the world. We are not the only ones, unfortunately. Um, then we, I will describe as lab uh, offshore materials and components lab. Uh, some other real environment tests that we have uh, in Technalia uh, beyond HasLab. Um, some examples of on how is testing at HasLab. Uh, then a brief description of the uh, testing that we are uh, we do as well in the lab, and some final remarks. So um, aging, as, as you all know, is is a is a slow process for 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 an industry uh, standard view. I mean. Uh, for industry, a uh, uh, 12 months uh, testing is a very long period when, when you are talking about uh, uh, getting products to the, to the market. So it's, it's quite slow for, for industrial standards. So uh, testing in the lab is, is really relevant for a quick stringing of, uh, of materials uh, through accelerated testing. But sometimes um, real life is, is not that easy to, to simulate. So uh, some other uh, testing are needed. Limitation of lab testing. Uh, well, you, you can test uh, a limited number of parameters at the same time. Uh, it's not easy or it's impossible to test uh, every single parameter that you need to, to, to demonstrate in a, in a, in a, in a testing. Uh, even long cycles uh, such as uh, NORSOC uh, have limitations to simulate uh, some real con life conditions such as fouling. Fouling is a condition that cannot be simulated uh, in the lab. And there are no clear correlation with real life. Uh, well, there are some studies that, uh, that already uh, correlate uh, NORSOC uh, aging testing in the lab with some kind of uh, approximately uh, approximate uh, duration in real life, but it's, it's not that easy. But uh, real life or real absorbed environment testing has its uh, own similar uh, limitation as well. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, time consuming. Uh, we are talking about a minimum of 12 months, so it's quite a lot of time. Uh, in practice, uh, it's limited to understand initial mechanisms of failure, uh, as, as you all suppose. Uh, it's not realistic to test uh, a material for 10 years. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not possible. Um, and the third one is the lack of real offshore infrastructures where, where you can test uh, the, the, the components or the materials. So ideally, uh, lab testing should be combined with real life, uh, uh, real offshore testing. So that's a, a conclusion. OK, when we are talking of uh, real offshore environment in the in the uh, in the sea, uh, corrosion is the, is the main issue that uh, comes into our mind at the first time. So it's the first challenge for offshore infrastructures. It's said that uh, the annual global cost of uh, corrosion is about 300 uh, sorry, 3% of the world's GDP. And that's uh, about one third of that cost could be saved with an optimum uh, corrosion management practices that uh, not all the time are, are taking about are taking. According to NACE, uh, corrosion is the deterioration of a material, usually a metal, because of a reaction with the environment. That's uh, quite obvious. Uh, from the uh, basics of corrosion, you can you can know that uh, three basic uh, elements are needed for corrosion: a metal, oxygen, and an electrolyte. So, ocean is the perfect place for corrosion to be to be to happen. So, it's not that easy. There is not a single form of corrosion. You can find general corrosion is the easiest one because it's homogeneous in the surface of a, uh, a metal. Pitching corrosion, crevice, galvanic, stress corrosion, cracking, corrosion fatigue, and, and, and make some, some examples. It's quite complex. The, 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 the work corrosion is not that easy. Um, covering methods to prevent corrosion and mainly to uh, cathodic, uh, cathodic protection and, and painting and, and coating the, the surfaces. So, Corrosion is a slow reaction, but can be le can lead to a sudden failure with catastrophic consequences. Um, but that's why corrosion is so important, and that's why uh, we study this, this phenomena. OK, some examples of offshore testing around the world. I will, quick, uh, I will go quite, quite uh, quick uh, about this because, well, it's not a matter of the presentation. 
Okay, first, first of all, there's uh, RISE. RISE is the uh, Swedish uh, Research uh, Center, one of the main or the main Swedish Research Center. Uh, they have a test bed of four materials in the North Sea in the uh, Christenberg Marine Research and Innovation Center in, in Skafor, in Sweden. Uh, they have uh, facilities for testing in, in, in immersion and, is, and in uh, splash zone. Uh, the French Corrosion Institute, they have a, a, a facility in the Bay of Brest in, in France with Atlantic Ocean and Met Oceanic conditions. They have monetary conditions as well. It's quite important for all the, uh, the, the, the exposition sites to, to monitor what's happening there. And they have uh, three uh, exposure zones, tidal sediments and atmospheric zones. So, Another one is quite close to here is uh, CTC in the Vocal, Cantabria. They have a splash tidal and immersion zones uh, in the conditions of the Bay of Biscay. They is located in the in the coast. Another one is there from Hofer West uh, in Germany in the uh, North Sea as well. They have quite a lot uh, uh, sites uh, with different conditions. Another one in Genova, in the Mediterranean Sea, they have uh, atmosphere immersion and splash zone, uh, a weather station as well to monitor what's happening there. Uh, the APT in Brazil, uh, they have uh, one of the infrastructure where we, we, we based when designing the first version of the Hars Lab, uh, this kind of ship that we can see in the pic. They have uh, atmosphere splash and immersion zones in, in, the, in the South Sebastian in a canal in the South Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and then a couple of uh, facilities in, in the States, uh, but they are not properly uh, exposition zones, exposition sites, but they take water from, from, the, from the ocean uh, in tanks uh, that they uh, prepare in the, in, the, in the lab. So it's not, it's not the same. Okay, so I'm sure I will. Uh, I left uh, some some other testing sites uh, out of of this very very brief presentation, but but there are not too many in the world. So that's something that uh, a bunch of of a consortium of bus companies, uh, Technali and the Bus Energy Cluster, realized back in 2016. Um, there is a, a tendency of, of going to, to the ocean for, for all the uh, energy sector, but there is no a clear field of play for, for testing there. So there was a, a need uh, that uh, should be uh, uh, solved. So uh, we decided to, to launch a, a two-stage uh, schedule uh, to, to, to place a, a laboratory out in the sea with uh, the same mooring system, almost the same mooring system that can be uh, used in the same in the, in the two versions of the, of the hard lab. The point one, the 1.0 is the, the, the one that uh, we installed in September 2018. Uh, it was designed for small companies and prof testing uh, in three zones, immersion splash and atmospheric zones with no electric supply, but a little solar panel that is fits the, the lantern and, and the eight uh, equipment. And the second version will be installed uh, next spring, hopefully. Uh, it will be the 2.0. It will be, be bigger and fully functional that can test uh, uh, whole equipment uh, while, while working. It will have electric supply and it will have a couple of additional exposition zones such as seabed and, and confined. So this is how uh, one of well, the two versions share almost the same uh, moving system, which is quite uh, well. It uh, makes the, the the installation a little bit cheaper. Uh, okay, and this is a drawing of the the second version of the hash lab. Here is the the, the exposition sites that we already have in the in the first version: the atmospheric zone, the immersion zone, and the splash zone. There's another one, the confined zone. We can test, we will be able to, to test uh, materials and, and, and components uh, inside the, the HARS lab, the laboratory. Then uh, we will have the opportunity to test uh, coupons and components in, in, CV, in CVET at 65, 65 meters depth. Uh, we could test as well umbilicals, connectors, and risers, as I say, 
and even mooring components as I say, in the in the mooring lines. It was it is being designed by by Technalia with the support of of Idom um, and as company as well. Okay, so what's Haslab? Haslab is the Europe's first offshore floating laboratory for the evaluation of materials and components in real offshore environment. As I said, it was installed back in 2018. It has allowed about five meters of diameter and height and a light weight of eight tons and net buoyancy of 21 tons. Uh, one of the uh, things that we wanted when we designed the, the, the platform is that uh, we wanted to be free uh, to 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 be able to install and retire and inspect uh, the samples without divers, so we can uh, manage the, all the samples from the deck, which is quite quite good. Um, it's equipped with a standard navigation aids such as uh, Ace and, and Lantern, and we have our own uh, website that you can you can check it out. Everything, all the information is there. So this is the Hush Lab, uh, the day before it was uh, launched to the to the sea. Uh, so we can find, you can, we can see uh, very good here which are the three exposition zones: the atmospheric zone, the splash zone, and the immersion zone. We have a, a total of uh, 765 uh, samples, uh, 125 in the atmospheric zone, and the rest uh, in the splash zone and under the water. So Haslab is installed in, in BMEP. BMEP area is uh, an area, an experimental uh, open sea area uh, placed in, in front of uh, Biscay, Biscay, the coast of Vizcaya in the Bay of Biscay, sorry. Uh, it's, it's aimed to, to test uh, and demonstrate prototype devices for harnessing ocean energy. But we took advantage of, uh, advantage of the uh, surveillance and the facilities that we had there uh, to install the house lab as well. It's about 1.6 nautical miles away from the village of Arnitza. It has about uh, five square kilometers of total surface area. It's fully equipped with uh, subsea infrastructure for onshore grid connection, which will be quite convenient for the second version of the of the house lab. And it's really well communicated with, with the port of, of Arnitza. So we, we have a quick access while ensuring 100% uh, offshore conditions. Okay, the, the first difficulty that, that we found here is the, that the sea bottom in the in, in the zone that we wanted to install the hashtag is what it was quite challenging. Uh, mixed of sandy rock uh, seabed at uh, more than 60 meters depth. Uh, we found uh, not not so much sand in the in the in in the bottom. So. OK, mooring lines were complicated here, so we had to to buy bright half anchors, uh, really, really uh, big and expensive as well. Uh, this is some submarine pick of uh, how the, the mooring lines are in the in the seabed right now. Uh, OK, the, the, the mooring lines were specifically designed for, for the, the seabed condition that we found in, in, in BMEP, and it's composed by, by three mooring lines, each of them composed by a chain, a steel wire, and the, the anchors that, that we saw in the, in the previous slide. Uh, Core Marina supported uh, us in the design and the, of the maneuvers and the, and the logistics for, for installation that it was not, uh, not, not easy, it was quite challenging in, 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 in the, when hooking the ships and it's not easy that neither. So we have to monitor what's happening in Haslab. Uh, we have two strategies for, for monitor the, the, the behavior of the Haslab and how uh, it's surviving to the to the as well as in the winter. So first we have uh, the, the, the BMEP control center. They have installed uh, cameras uh, with a really good objectives uh, that can take a quite nice uh, picture of what's happening out there. They have a ship as well, so they can go to the sea if, if anything is, is wrong. And then we have a second strategy that's a GPS based uh, tracker on board. This is a GPS based tracker that gives us a lot of information of the points where the, the hash lab is. So we can detect any strange movement if something 
strange happens in the boolean lines we can see here indirectly by the the position of the hash lab uh, we can see as well uh, the role the pitch and, and some other parameters that help us to understand if something strange is happening in the in the moon line so it's really valuable for for us okay so this is a, a small video i want to show you um about how the hash lab is behaving in a not really big as well uh, during last winter it's about two meters high waves uh, we already missed uh, uh, measure uh, waves up to 10 meters. So this is a good day and you can see how the, the hash lab is behaving, how the samples are uh, continued, continuous impact by waves, by falling. Uh, this is real life. This is not a portrait, uh, portrait uh, station when you can leave samples and everything is quiet, everything is fine. Uh, here we have problems. We learned a lot during these months uh, to how to fix properly the, the samples to the to the to the laboratory and how to manage with, with this kind of conditions. So it's not it's not it's not easy. Okay, and monitoring um, is it's really important uh, to, to know what, what what's what's going on uh, in, in meteoroceanic condition as well. So otherwise uh, the conclusions uh, of the study uh, won't have sense. Uh, so we have pretty close Escalimet uh, meteorological stations to the to, to the hash lab to the BMEP area. We are lucky because Escalimet is managed by Technalia, so our colleagues from Technalia give a excellent uh, uh, reports of of what happened during the the size. Um, and we have a, a an oceanographic boy. Uh, installed in BMAP area as well, so we have the, the oceanic data uh, pretty pretty good as well. Okay, real environment test at Atlantia Beyond has lab. A couple of slides of two additional uh, offshore testing uh, uh, places or sites that we have. We have first one is in the port of Pasay in Guipúzcoa in the north of Spain as well. Is uh, estuarine port conditions is not uh, open sea conditions such uh, has lab. Uh, it's only in immersion zone because it's placed on a floating jetty, no, no tidal at all. Uh, easy access again and monitoring for of environmental parameters, very very important. And uh, well, this is especially prone to the growth of of biofouling because of. Uh, low retention time of water, high uh, content of, of nutrients and so on. So it's, for us it's a quite good uh, quick screen uh, testing of, of, of uh, anti-following uh, surfaces, for example. Okay, another one is not really Technalia, but uh, in fact is, is placed in, in, in Plocan, in the port of Taliart in Gran Canaria, Canary Islands. Um, I said it's, it's not really Technalia, but we recently uh, signed a collaboration agreement with them, so we can interchange samples between uh, our uh, sites and, and theirs. So it's a very good, uh, I think, for, for all of us. Uh, now we can offer to our clients not only uh, testing in, in, the, in the Cantabrian Sea, uh, but also in the in subtropical climate as, as the Atlantic Ocean, so it's really good for us. Uh, we have as well an oceanographic station uh, nearby. A uh, total of 140 samples can be tested in, in splash tidal and immersion zones. It's pretty good for us as well because we don't have in the in our installations tidal. We we all uh, everything we have is floating in the sea, so we don't have a tidal. Uh, the bad news is that not currently under construction, but it will be hopefully fully operative in autumn of this year. So that's a very good collaboration for us. I hope we can share this with our clients and well, we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so some brief examples of what is testing at HashLab. Okay, first thing, obvious thing that we can test in HashLab is corrosion. Corrosion, we already, the first thing that we did uh, when we installed the, the laboratory is to uh, uh, determine experimentally uh, which is the corrosion rate for carbon, steel, copper and aluminium. So we can 
classify the corrosivity of the of the testing site is essential for for every anybody who can who want to test here. So we reach to the conclusion that is classified as CX for atmospheric and splash zone and IM2 for immersion zone. It's the maximum corrosivity uh, classification for both. So uh, here we can study, as, as I mentioned before, how real offshore conditions affect the initiation mechanisms of corrosion and their corrosion rate of specimens. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, if we think that we can also uh, uh, think that interaction, uh, we can also combine the, the corrosion with the biofouling effect. Uh, that's something that, as I said, cannot be uh, tested in the laboratory, so it's really interesting. So we identify the, the main species that uh, grow in the in the in the in the hash lab in the sun, and last the aging assays uh, that is, are not related to corrosion or fouling, such as what are the what are the uh, aesthetical properties, how the aesthetical properties vary with with time, flexibility, uh, color, uh, whatever. Uh, it's important for, for several uh, sectors as well. So who can test here? It's, we are open to any company or research organization interested in, in, in performing agent tests. We already have uh, both public funded and, and private projects running in, in HasLab. We are almost 20 uh, private partners that uh, already tested or are testing their materials in, 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 in the laboratory. We are involved in three Horizon 2020 projects so far, uh, Marina 2, Nemo and, and New Skin. Um, we are testing as well our own uh, developers, de developments, uh, including two patents on, on new coatings, which is quite interesting. Uh, we, are, we have all already tested uh, almost 400 samples, and another 200 or something like that are already on the way. And we are currently preparing uh, leading edge uh, Horizon 2020 proposals as well. So I think that as the market or the research community in, in Europe uh, understood quite well what we are offering and uh, how testing in real officer conditions, how good it is. So this is a very, very brief uh, comparison between how uh, samples behave in a salt spray testing the lab for uh, 1,400 hours versus immersion exposition at lab at hash lab uh, of uh, organic coating. We can see here this, th those pictures are on the left and the lab uh, after the, the testing on the right the the, the hash lab species. Um, we can observe that uh, quite higher condition corrosion rates in, in hash lab in 30 months. And these are the, the, the testing of pull off uh, adherence after aging. Again, uh, less uh, tension, less uh, force was needed to, 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 broke, to break the, the, the coating. This is a comparison of a C5 cycling corrosion test in the lab versus atmospheric exposition hash lab. Uh, again, 100, oh, sorry, 1,600 hours in the lab. Uh, 10 cycles at Norsoc, uh, according to Norsoc, against uh, three, uh, 13 months in, in HasLab. Again, much higher corrosion, corrosion uh, are, are detected in the, in the offshore conditions. And this last is a, a C5 a cycling corrosion against atmospheric exposition in a organic coating with zinc. Uh, in the lab, no corrosion was observed, while in the HasLab, yes, we, we observe appreciable corrosion. So, uh, materials are the main objective of the laboratory, but it's not the only one. We are not limited to testing probes, but we are open to other research activities. Some examples are the tra tracker system. I already explained how does it work. Uh, it's a research and development project for uh, the, 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 our client, and it's a valuable information for us as well. Is an example of how we can share um, the cost of, of testing if it's interesting for us. Uh, we have a project 
as well about uh, summary identification and communication systems. Uh, we will use uh, Haslab as a base to uh, test these communication systems uh, at a depth of up to 60 meters depth, so it's quite quite nice. Uh, we can test novel sensor sensors for offshore applications. As I said, we are quite far away from the coast, so it's, uh, we are really uh, at offshore conditions. Uh, new methodologies for mooring offshore structures. Uh, we can use our mooring lines for, for testing novel uh, methodologies for, for mooring strategies. Uh, testing uh, submarine handle, uh, handling uh, systems as well, novel oceanographic radars, and many more. So the the, the limit is, is is your imagination. We are open to to anything that can be tested in the lab. Okay, so a few a couple of slides of uh, testing at the at the lab, not at the Hars lab, but in the lab. Uh, this is a complement, as I said, for for the testing in the in the offshore. Uh, we have, uh, I, will, I will go quite quickly around, uh, on this. Accelerated testing, we have a, a wide variety of uh, chambers with different uh, salt spray, cycling, castanets, uh, climatic changes, everything needed to simulate the, the corrosion, the aging processes, general corrosion testing facilities as well, coating laboratory testing as well, and failure analysis and corrosion inspection. So we have a fully equipped uh, and laboratories in uh, related to corrosion and coatings. And these two uh, standards and specifications about uh, uh, anti-fouling, how to evaluate uh, anti-fouling uh, results that we are uh, in, uh, texting, uh, testing in the, in the HAS lab or in the port of Pasaya or in Plocan. So these are the, the, the standards. So final slides, uh, some final conclusions. Uh, testing takes more time in offshore environment that, that in the lab, but lessons learned on initial corrosion mechanisms are really valuable. Uh, we cannot simulate falling in, 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 in the lab, uh, as I said a couple of times. Um, falling uh, can increase or increase the corrosion rate in, in coatings. We have shared it a lot of times, so that's really interesting. Uh, the minimum representing time, testing time is about 12 months, although uh, shorter or longer testing can be, can be performed as well. Uh, testing in the ocean is usually more aggressive than, than, than those testing in the lab, as we, can, uh, as we saw in the, in the slides. Uh, real offshore testing should be followed by uh, lab testing. None of them make sense without the other. Testing sites in port and, and coastal structure are quite common around the world, but not, may, not many real offshore testing sites uh, available. Materials behave different in different climate conditions, so a global network of offshore sites for material testing is recommended. Uh, we already started with uh, Plocan, but our idea is to continue to wider the, the, our network. And finally, well, bad news. So everything in the ocean is expensive. Uh, you have to hire to rent ships, divers, insurances, maintenance. So testing offshore is obviously more expensive than, than lab testing. Sorry to, to leave this bad news for, for the end, but <laughs> that's, that's reality. So that was my, my last, 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 last slide. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. And I don't know if there's any question right now. Uh, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much uh, again, Pablo, for, for the, your presentation. I know we have uh, we have time for for some questions. Uh, I have, uh, I think, fourteen more more or less fourteen questions. So please be brief and go directly to the to the question. First question is in relation with how the layers are uh, the the projects that we are ongoing on the on the hash lab. Uh, how the layers are uh, because of the uh, COVID-19? Um, well, um, the the good thing about the about testing in, in the in the offshore is that uh, the, the the periods are quite long. So um, we are making uh, an inspection every three months. So we made the inspection in February before the lockdown, and we made another one uh, a couple of weeks ago. So 
there was no delay for our side. Uh, some samples that uh, you were going to, to come in March uh, didn't came, didn't come. So uh, it was more a question, a question for clients than for us. Uh, we can go to the hash lab uh, any, any, any time, almost any time, no, not during the, the lockdown, but, but yes, we can go. It's a, well, in relation with this is a, a recent, recent question is how often are inspections to hardless performed? Uh, do, we usually uh, offer uh, well, once every three months uh, visual inspection. Um, I say visual because when we go there, we usually only clean the uh, racks, the, the surfaces of the hash lab. We don't clean the samples, so we don't disturb the, the growth of the folding, which is the objective of, the, of, of most, most of the test. So yeah, once every three months. Uh, is is the is the is possible that the hash lab was connected to the electrical grid? Yeah, in fact, the the, the second version of the of the hash lab will be connected to electrical grid. Yeah, that will be uh, really uh, important for us because we will be able to test to perform tests that currently we are not able to perform. Yeah. And how is the data collected being transmitted to the servers on shore? Satellite signal, radio. Um, well, the hash lab is located uh, far away from the coast, but not that far away. I mean, there's, we have a 3G uh, a signal, so we have uh, a mobile signal. So the, the data from the position and the tracker are, are going through the uh, a mobile signal. It's quite easy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have investigated the connections with the button. Um, with the C button. With the but, C button, I, I understand. Yeah, uh, until now we, we didn't place any sample in the in the seabed. Uh, that's something that that we are planning to to prepare the the, the new version to 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 handle. So nowadays we didn't do that, but it's, this is something that we will uh, we will prepare the second version for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the lab's motion has any influence in the trials, or it's only a danger for 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 the security and for prevention. Which one? The the, the motion of the lab. Okay. Okay. Motion of the lab. Okay. No. No. There's there's no problem for the, for the trials because but we manage. Uh, I, I will lie if I say that we didn't lost any sample yet. <laughs> we we lost a couple of them. Uh, but we we'll learn a lot each time we we'll lose the sample. So, but no, no, the 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 movement of the of the of the hash lab is not a problem for the samples, at least for those samples that we already tested. Mm -hmm. It is possible to test equipment with real with electrical consumption in kilowatts in real of soil conditions. Uh, right now, no, but from uh, spring next year onwards, yes, it will be possible. Mm -hmm. the, the, the harsh lab can be used as a, a personal training platform? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we are open to, 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 to any kind of uh, activities that can be performed in the, in the harsh lab. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, are different steps for testing the marine grove on the platform? Different depths in relation with the surface, I understand. Um, yeah, actually, uh, we found uh, differences between each side of the hash lab. Uh, we found that it's not the same falling that is growing in the south uh, facing uh, surfaces in the hash lab than in the north. Uh, we found that uh, those samples that, that, that are oriented towards the west or the northwest are heavily impacted by waves much more than those that are in the in the east. Uh, we didn't study yet uh, which are exactly those difference, but uh, we can we can we can see uh, every day we go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you able to carry out underwater operations in harsh lab with rows? Um, yes, no, no, not yet, not now, but this is something that we want to uh, to face in the in the next version as well. Uh, we are really interested in knowing what's 
going on uh, down there uh, without having to 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 rent divers, which is really really expensive. So yeah, it's, it's something really really interesting for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do do, uh, do you uh, have any plan for it or? Uh, well, spring next, uh, next year, spring 2021 uh, is the is the expected date for for the 2.0, and uh, yeah, we are in fact we are planning to to buy. This is something that we have in mind. We have to check if we have money enough uh, to buy our own roof, so we can handle those 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 things by ourselves. Yeah. Next next question is for Antonio. Uh, Antonio, switch on the, the microphone, please. Uh, OK, yes. uh, we, have, we have seen prototypes of wave energy converters for more than 15 years. Why do you think the wave energy development is being delayed so long? Oh, yes, uh, very good question. I think if we look at what's happening with the, for example, offshore wind, I think uh, a long time ago in offshore wind, uh, technicians decided to focus on only one uh, development in only one technology. This technology is uh, horizontal axis and uh, three, ba uh, three blades uh, turbine. And um, in this way, uh, resources were concentrated only to develop one, one, one technology. I think in, the, in, in, in wave energy, uh, at present, um, the resources to develop uh, this, uh, not only one device, not only one technology, are very distributed. And uh, this is the reason maybe that uh, technicians are not focused on develop only one technology, only one kind of, uh, of technology. Okay, thank you very much, Antonio. Next, we come back to Pablo. Pablo, okay. uh, in your experience, what what is the average time required for a complete biofouling test? Uh, we usually recommend 12 months um, because then you cover the annual uh, growth of uh, organisms. But uh, we found that in six months, it depends on the on the season as well. Uh, we observed that uh, during springtime and summertime, the growth of uh, uh, algae and, and mussels and so on are much bigger than during the, the winter. But uh, that, that, that's why we recommend to, to test during 12 months. But uh, well, uh, in, in six months, we can see uh, really nice uh, uh, falling growth. Yeah. OK, and the other question is in relation with uh, harbor areas or harbor exposure sites. Although they are not really of sort conditions, can be used to test material corrosion. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, in fact, we we are doing uh, that in, in in the port of Pasaya uh, during a couple of years from now. Uh, it's really interesting as well. It depends a lot on the conditions of the port. I mean, in in Pasaya, we are in the very end of the port, so. Uh, very low retention time. We, we have very low retention time. It's not the same that if if you are testing in the in the mouth of the port, for example, then you have uh, pretty close conditions to 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 those found in 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 in, in open sea. So yeah, they are very useful. A, a, a question uh, for for uh, Antonio, please. Is from your point of view, what is the most promising wave energy technology? Oh, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, promising technology is the, I think, I think is the oscillating water column. I think this technology uh, has demonstrated that this um, reliable, that is, uh, that the energy generated is um, more or less cheap or close to be cheap. I think, I think the, it has shown that the cost is the lowest among its uh, competitors. I think I think the most promising is uh, should be the wave, uh, the oscillating wa uh, water column. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, for for uh, Pablo, it is possible to test anti fouling device like ultraviolet device, for example. Um, 
I don't really understand the, 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 the question. Um, if okay. it means to, to, to install a UV, a UV device uh, on board, uh, now it is not possible. Uh, in the second version, it, it might be. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, what is she thinking about, but yeah, it might be possible. We can talk about that. Mm -hmm. but we are, uh, what we are doing at this moment is checking some cuttings from anti falling cuttings and these kind of things, not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. absolutely. Uh, anti falling uh, testing is, is, is one of the main uh, challenges for, for, the, for, for, for HasLab. Uh, yeah, we are open to that. Okay. Another question is, uh, it is possible or will be possible to create a standard to relate an scalable LAT results to offshore results so the time and cost can be safe in the future? Yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the mother of the lamp. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> An idiom in English. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's the, the final objective that you can calibrate uh, uh, how, how many hours you need in the lab to test uh, equivalent time in the, in the offshore in, 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 in real life. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy because uh, you can. You can make an estimation for the Cantabrian Sea, but then you go to the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and then you have a completely different results or to the North Sea or to Guinea. I don't know. Uh, so you might have uh, an estimation for uh, some conditions such as HASLAB, but then uh, you will need to recalibrate if you want to go to Brazil, for example. OK, it is possible to waste samples with biofouling in, in periodic inspections to weigh, to, to know the weight of the sample? Um, yeah, it's possible. I mean, uh, we can take the samples out, weight them in a, in a portable uh, weight, uh, vascule. Uh, yeah, it's possible. But uh, once you extract the sample from the from the water, <coughs> it has a lot of a lot of water. So you will have uh, very varying uh, weights. I don't know if it will be representative. Uh, we can do it if if the client wants wants to. Uh, we can do it. Yeah. Uh, another question: Have you considered submerging samples at different depths? Uh, now, uh, right now, in the in the one point zero, we only have uh, well, we have a, a depth in between zero and two meters. Uh, in the second version, we will uh, we will be able to 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 expose uh, uh, samples uh, up to the seabed. Yeah, 65 meters. Yeah, will be possible. Not now, but uh, yes, in the future. Okay. In relation with the second version of the HasLab, how big is expected that they will be? It will be. Um, it has, there has been uh, quite a lot of changes, uh, but I think it will be around uh, 10 meters uh, in diameter. 10 meters yeah. diameter. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pablo and Antonio. That was that was the, the last question. So uh, thank you very much for, for your interesting presentation and also thank you very much for, for, the, the, for answering the, the questions. And we, we finish here this webinar about testing and research in offshore environments, an opportunity for energy generation and challenge for materials. I remember the audience that uh, you can contact directly Antonio or Pablo using the email you have on the presentation that uh, you, you'll have at the video and also you have at, uh, the, the, the emails at the chat. And uh, we thank you again for your interest and we hope to meet you again in around this or other uh, interest, uh, common interest uh, subjects. Thank you and have a nice day.